And now, Dr. Watson, what about tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure? Mm, yes, it concerns the weekend Holmes and I spent at Bowman's Knock among the Toxopolites. Uh, the, uh, what Olites? Toxophilites, Mr. Harris, are gentlemen addicted to the not-so-gentle sport of archery. Oh, you mean the boys who play around with bows and arrows. <laughs> I suppose you might express it that way. Bowman's Knock was the country home of Sir Timothy Fletcher, who was at that time president of the Royal Toxophilites Society. The Prince of Wales, of course, was its patron. Oh, naturally. However, he wasn't present at this particular house party. Besides Holmes and myself, there were only four other guests. Major and Mrs. Cheltenham... Professor Phil Potts, and a South American millionaire, Senor Juan Vendrigo. Oh, little did I think when I first made their acquaintance on Sir Timothy's shooting green that before the next sunrise I should see one of them dead as a doornail. Well, it sounds as if your taxophy, whatever you call them, took their sport seriously, Dr. Watson. <laughs> yes, a bit too seriously, Mr. Harris. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon in early spring when Holmes and I alighted from our train at Helmsley on Wilton, which is the station for Bowman's Knock. Sir Timothy Fletcher had come to meet us in a dog cart drawn by a handsome cob. Uh, Doctor, I thought a cob was a male swan. In sporting circles, Mr. Harris, a cob generally refers to a small, stocky horse having a high, stylish leg action. Well, then, a dog cart is, is not drawn by dogs. Certainly not. A dog cart's a very, well, um, uh, as you'd say, a snappy two-wheel conveyance with seats placed back to back. Mm, doesn't sound particularly comfortable to me. Oh, this mechanized age. It wasn't supposed to be comfortable. It was dashing. Oh. Well, as I was saying before being certain interruptions, uh, our host piled us and our somewhat battered assortment of luggage into the cart, and off we started. The birds were singing, the sun was warm and gentle, the trees were covered with tender green foliage, only Sir Timothy seemed at odds with nature. Confounded, Holmes, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. There's something brewing, something nasty. We might have known, Watson, that Sir Timothy hadn't invited us merely for a bucolic weekend. Holmes, you know dashed well. If you had nothing but the ordinary country house party to look forward to, you wouldn't have accepted my invitation. Got you that time, Holmes. Yes, I gathered from your notes, Sir Timothy, that things don't seem to be entirely placid at Bowman's Knock. Seems to be the difficulty. It's uh, that confounded Spaniard, Juan Vendrigo. He should never have invited that bloated millionaire to join the Royal Toxopolite Society. Why did you? We needed new equipment. It's expensive, and he's filthy rich, and a dash good shot besides blast him. However, he insists on shooting for high stakes, worse luck. We're all heavily indebted to him. Well, sounds to me as if it had been cheaper to buy your own equipment in the first place. Uh, it undoubtedly would, Dr. Watson. Oh, most of us haven't lost more than we can afford, I suppose, but unfortunately, Major Cheltenham has gone off the deep end. He's the crack shot of the woodman of Arden. Oh, I see. A rival society of archers. Exactly. He'd never been beaten until Senor Vendrigo came along. They're uh, fairly evenly matched. Vendrigo has better direction, although the Major has more pull and distance. Well, it seems that last Monday, Senor Vendrigo went down to Meriden, where the woodmen hold their meetings. In the course of an afternoon shooting, Major Cheltenham managed to lose a large sum of money, which he could ill afford. And I suppose he insisted on a return match. He did, the numbskull. Senor Vendrigo invited him to a return match at our shooting grounds, which, as you know, are situated in Regent's Park. Mm. Professor Phil Potts was invited to keep score. Oh, you don't mean Professor Winsgate Phil Potts, the eminent physicist? I do indeed. He's an exceptionally fine shot. His aim is practically infallible. If it went for the poor fellow's hunched back and his consequent inability to draw to a point over 38 pounds, well... He'd be the greatest archer in Europe. Oh, here, here. You must uh, forgive Watson if he looks slightly confused, Sir Timothy. His trusty service revolver is the only lethal weapon he understands. And you, I suppose, know what Sir Timothy is talking about. Hmm? Quite. The power to draw an arrow to the point means the measure of pull necessary to draw the bowstring to the position from which the arrow is released is measured in pounds. The power required to draw an ordinary bow for a man ranges from 40 to 60 pounds. Women's bows, of course, can be drawn by a power of from 24 to 32 pounds. Well, that means, I suppose, that the ladies can't shoot as great a distance as the men. Brilliant deduction, my dear Watson. You're coming along. Pretty soon I shall have to look to my laurels. Oh, go to blazes. Uh, as I was saying, Professor Phil Potts was chosen as scorer for the match. As a president of the club, I was naturally on hand to see that everything went off without a hitch. These uh, grudge matches are often quite tricky, you know. 
grudge match. Oh, yes. Didn't I mention that Senor Vendrigo had been rather obviously attentive to Mrs. Cheltenham? And the Major doesn't like it. Hmm. Interesting, eh, Watson? Uh, that rather depends upon Mrs. Cheltenham, I should say. <laughs> yes, she's, a, she's a charming little thing. I can't say I blame her for being flattered by the senor. Her, her husband treats her abominably. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. It was agreed that the match should consist of a York round. Yes, for gentlemen, Watson, the York round consists of six dozen arrows at 100 yards, four dozen at 80 yards, and two dozen at 50 yards. By Jove, and each time the would-be Robin Hood shoots his silly little arrow... He has to use from 40 to 50 pounds pressure. I say that's quite a bit of exercise. Contrary to the common belief, Watson, archery is a rather rugged sport. But uh, go on with the story, Sir Timothy. It was a glorious afternoon for the match. Sun not too bright, the air as still as a mill pot. Phil Potts and I were arranging the arrows close to the south hedge. When suddenly from the other side of the bushes, we heard two voices raised in a rather, well, nasty argument. <laughs> My advice to you, my dear Major, is to, uh, what you say, cut down on the consumption of alcohol, or you will not be able to see the target, let alone hit the goal. Mind your own business, you dirty... Gently, little... Major, gently. Do not make me to lose my temper, or I shall refuse to shoot the match. Go ahead. What's it to me? Only this. If you do not win back what you have lost to me, you must pay what you already owe. But that you cannot do you would have to go into bankruptcy. And if you go into bankruptcy, you will be obliged to resign from the army in disgrace. No. Why, you dirty young... You have heaven. said that once already. To me, the repetition is offensive. It is only from the goodness of my heart, remember, that I give you the opportunity to win back your losses. What can I gain from the match? What do you mean? You have no money to wager. You have already lost that. You have no property you can mortgage. There is only one thing that still belongs to you of any value whatsoever. What's that? Your charming wife, of course. Leave my wife out of this. Oh, do not be alarmed, my dear Major. I do not wish to marry the lady. In my country, we do not believe in divorce. No, we will make other arrangements. What are you getting at? I suggest, uh, merely suggest, mind you, that should you lose the match... Which isn't likely. There's no win today. I never miss when it's still... I say, should you lose, you will arrange to neglect your wife sometime this weekend, when we are all guests at Bowman's Knock. You think I'd stand by and see any man make advances to my wife? Oh, heaven forbid. I merely suggest I shall, uh, shall we say, visit Mrs. Cheltenham? Uh, surely, if you have confidence in your wife, and your ability as an archer, what can you possibly lose? It's outrageous, say eh, Holmes. Of course, I suppose the Major refused to go on with the match. How could he, Watson? I had a good mind to call off the match myself, Mr. Holmes, until Professor Philpotts pointed out that if we took any cognizance of the matter, everyone would know we'd been eavesdropping, which would have been embarrassing all around, don't you know? Very. Moreover, the Major and Senor Vendrigo would have probably gone off and shot the match somewhere else without proper supervision. Unthinkable. What happened? The match was nip and tuck all the way. Senor Vendrigo had a slight advantage at the beginning. Uh, do you know that the Major's use of spiritous liquors? Quite, but by and by, as he became more sober, his aim became absolutely deadly. Moreover, as the afternoon wore on, Senor Vendrigo began to tire. And the Major didn't? The Major, my dear Holmes, is an ox. Well, believe it or not, when it came to the final shot, the score was absolutely even. Vendrigo shot first and hit the gold. The gold? That's a bullseye, Watson. Uh, Did the Major equal the shot? Uh, they were now shooting at 50 yards. It shouldn't have been too difficult. I, I, I tell you, my heart was in my mouth, and I could see the sweat pouring down Philpott's face. But just as the Major drew his arrow home, Senor Vendrigo sneezed. Oh, dashed unsporting. Well, of course, the arrow went wide of the mark. No, Dr. Watson. If it had done so, I should have insisted the Major take the shot over. But he hit a red. Vendrigo claimed the Major had already released the arrow when he sneezed. Otherwise, the shot must have gone much wider off the mark. No. 
No, we were obliged to give Vendrigo the match. He won by a single point. Under doubtful circumstances. Is the Major a man to take things lying down? Why do you think I asked you down to Bowman's knock, Mr. Holmes? I'm expecting an explosion. And I think I can promise it won't be nice. Suppose we alight here, gentlemen, and let the gatekeeper drive the luggage up to the house. Here you are, Rogers. Yes, sir. Uh, tell Parsons the bags go in the tower bedroom. Yes, sir. Get up, you, but... Now then, we'll walk across the park, Holmes. I want you and Dr. Watson to meet the rest of the house party. I left them clout shooting on the south green. Clout? What sort of bird or animal is a clout? It's neither, Watson. A clout is a small white target placed near the ground. Right. Clout shooting is an informal variety of archery. Don't hold with it, myself. But it gives Major Cheltenham a chance to show off his confounded Norman bow. It's an atrocity, if you ask me. Nearly six and a half feet long. And would you believe it? It takes over 70 pounds to draw the silly thing. It's been in the Cheltenham family for years. The Major claims it goes back to the Norman invasion and probably belonged to William the Conqueror. Yes, I believe he was supposed to have had a bow that no one else could draw. But it couldn't be the same bow, Holmes, not after all these years. Quite. Don't, I beg you, don't say that to the Major. It would be sacrilege. Tell me, Sir Timothy, how is your party getting on? Any signs of violence so far? None whatever. They arrived in a group by the early morning train. Apparently the trip down had been completely amicable. Well, maybe the storm has blown over. I doubt it. The Major's neck is puffed up like a poison pup. And Senor Vendrigo keeps tapping incessantly with the fingers of his left hand. Both, I take it, danger signals. Right. They're nearly there. Just around the next hedge. Ah! Duck, Watson. But I say... <gasps> oh, confounded! Someone shot my hat off. Look, there it is. An arrow straight through it. <laughs> Lucky you were wearing your top hat, Watson. Fast is a call of warning. The golfer shouts four, the archer calls fast. Confound it! No one had any business to shoot in this direction. What silly Oh, Paul. dear. Oh, dear. I do hope no one's hurt. I tried to stop the Major, but I, I'm afraid he's been drinking again. <laughs> and like a small boy with a snowball, he just couldn't resist a top hat. Holmes, that's <laughs> not very funny. I might have been killed. Oh, no. No, I don't think so. My husband is really an excellent shot. Then you, I gather, are Mrs. Cheltenham. Oh, yes. oh, sorry. Where are my manners? Mrs. Cheltenham, may I present Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson? Uh, how do you do? Oh, not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I'm afraid so, Mrs. Cheltenham. But it's nothing to be alarmed about, madam. He's really quite harmless, you know. To anyone who stays on the right side of the law. Ah, here come the others. Good Lord. I made a hash of your hat, old man. Sorry. Yes. But you'll admit it did fly through the air like an eagle. <laughs> a golden eagle. <laughs> yeah, at least this time it is not the Latin exuberance which is to blame, Sir Timothy. No uh, British lack of judgment, I'm afraid. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, Major Cheltenham, Senor Vendrigo. How do you and, do, uh, oh, oh, yes, uh, Professor Philpott. As usual, I am the postscript. Which uh, so frequently carries the gist of the communication, Professor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. My ego could do with a bit of bolstering. Uh, these two have been putting it over me all afternoon. I can't hope to equal their archery scores, you know. Why don't you give up, Phil Potson? Oh. Uh, shoot with the women. Arthur. Major, really? Oh, do not feel badly, Professor. Even I cannot draw that great hulking bow he so brags about. Uh. It is fit for nothing but to kill cows. That's about enough. Oh, Shatha, please. Huh? Oh, well. I can't blame you chaps for being jealous, I suppose. Here, have a look at this bow, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Ever seen its equal? Hmm, it is rather remarkable, Major Cheltenham. I've certainly never seen a self-bow this size. Yes, it consists of a single piece of you, as flexible as the day it was made. Uh, if you have the strength to draw it, of course. Which you apparently have, Major. That's right, I have. What's more, I'm the only one that has. Oh, but uh, here, I'd best retrieve my arrow out of the doctor's hat. Here, I say, you've torn my hat to shreds. I'm you... sorry, but uh, these arrows are valuable, you know. Can't use ordinary arrows with this bow. As you can see, these arrows are painted gold. The shaft is extra long and tipped with eagle feathers, and the cock feather is from a golden eagle. Oh, well, we best return to our mutton, Vendrigo. 
Or we shall never finish our round by tea time. Absolutely. It gives me not much time to prove, my dear Major, that there is more to archery than brute strength. Come along, Philpott. At least you can keep accurate score. Holmes, I don't like those people. Not even Mrs. Cheltenham and the Professor? Oh, I dare say they're harmless enough. I wonder, Watson. I wonder. You want to do a friend a real favor? Simply tell him to hurry to the store in your community that sells clipper craft clothes. Where else can he find such remarkable quality at prices so exceptionally modest? He'll wonder how in these days of high prices such values, including beautifully tailored, long-wearing worsteds, are possible. The answer is the famous Clipper Craft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. The plan's the reason you get these wonderful, really costly-looking Clipper Craft suits at only $40 and $45, spring top coats in fine coverts and worsted gabardine at only $40 and $45, and sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and sport jackets. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to our story. Night has fallen. It is past midnight. Holmes and Watson are hiding in an upstairs closet. I say, Holmes, why are we sitting here in this darkened linen closet? It's past midnight and my legs are getting cramped. If you must wait for an accident to happen, why not go back to our room where we can be at least comfortable? Impossible, Watson. This closet has a much better view of Mrs. Cheltenham's door and the two corridors which approach it at right angles. Uh, just what do you think is going to happen? I don't know, confide it. Wait a minute. I hear steps on the front stairs. Sounds like the Major. Because his steps are unsteady and you know he's been drinking. It doesn't take a genius to deduce that, Holmes. I didn't say it did. Quiet. He's turned the corner. Here he comes. He's stopped at his wife's door. His hand's on the knob. No. He's changed his mind. He's gone on down the back corridor. Holmes, did you notice that bulge in his pocket? It could have been a revolver, you know. Or a bottle. Now everyone's turned in except the South American. The professor went upstairs directly after dinner. Mrs. Cheltenham and our host retired after we finished the third rubber of whist. Well, that was nearly two hours ago. What arouses my curiosity, Watson, is why the Major retired down the back corridor. Maybe he's gone to visit Professor Philpotts or Sir Timothy. They both have rooms somewhere along there. Maybe he felt hungry and slipped down the back stairs to the larder. I could do with a bit of cold chicken myself, come to think of it. Is that uh, half past twelve or one o'clock, do you suppose? What difference does it make? Hello. Someone else is sneaking up the front stairs. I can't hear a thing. He's tiptoeing. Yes. Here he comes. It's Senor Vendrigo. Holmes, I don't like the look on his face. There's something evil, like a prowling beast. Yes. He's stopping at Mrs. Cheltenham's door. He's looking up and down both corridors. Now he's taken hold of the doorknob. <laughs> Great Scott, Holmes, what happened? Vendry goes pinned to the door, something sticking out of his back. It's a golden arrow. Shut up, Watson, and come along. What's happened? What, 
Oh, what's happened? Someone shot Vendrigo with one of the Major's arrows. He's dead. Killed instantly. The arrow is embedded over two inches in the solid oak of the door. Uh, could only have been my bow that made that shot. Clean through the man and into the door. <laughs> only an arrow from my bow has that strong a flight. It's gone home. The arrow's gone home. <laughs> Stop that laughing, you fool. You're drunk. That is not laughing, Dr. Watson. It's the word of call of all archers from time immemorial. He-he! Better let Dr. Watson give you another cup of coffee, Mrs. Cheltenham. I don't need it, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'm glad my husband shot that brute. I knew he wouldn't let him come into my room. Now, now, my dear, we all realize there are extenuating circumstances. I'm sure the law won't punish him too severely. I I hope you understand. I, uh, that is, I, I had to give him in charge. I understand. All the same, Sir Timothy, I think you were just a bit hasty in handing him over to that fool of a constable. What do you mean? It should have been obvious to a child of four that Major Cheltenham was too drunk to have made that need a shot. Straight through the heart, wasn't it, Watson? But uh, it was his bow that was used. We found it at the end of the corridor. He's the only one that has the strength to draw it. Besides, he didn't deny he'd killed Vendrigo. Again, he probably was too hazy to realize exactly what did happen. Oh, but here comes Phil Potts. His cane sounds unusually staccato this morning. Good morning, Professor. You don't look as though you'd had too good a night. I must admit that I didn't shut my eyes after I awakened and was informed what happened. But you did manage to sleep through the murder. Yes. Can't explain it. Usually such a light sleeper. Probably all that sun and fresh air yesterday. No, I won't have an egg, thank you. Just coffee. Can't face an egg this morning. Yes. Committing a murder does take away the appetite. Doesn't it, Professor? I... What do you mean? I'm suggesting that you were the man who shot Senor Vendrigo at five minutes past one last night. With the Major's famous bow? I believe it's agreed that that was the weapon used, Mr. Holmes. Indubitably. Then don't you see how ridiculous your statement is? That bow requires 70 pounds to draw it. I'm physically incapable of more than 45 pounds. Using the ordinary or manual method, yes. However, there are other ways of exerting pressure besides pulling. What are you suggesting? It doesn't take an expert physicist like yourself to understand the value of leverage. Well, what good would that do? I suggest that the professor's cane would make an excellent lever. He has a very handy small crook at the upper end. By hooking that through the string and using, shall we say, the back of a chair or even the handle of your bedroom door as a fulcrum, all the professor had to do was press the weight of his body down against the cane and the arrow could easily be drawn to the point and shot through a partly open door. A very interesting theory, my dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes. But it takes more than theory to hang a man. It takes evidence. I think I can provide that as well, Professor. You see, I noticed the drops of blood trickling down onto your left wrist when the constable was questioning you last night. Nasty gash, isn't it? Don't you think you'd be wise to let Dr. Watson dress it? Uh, what's all this about, Holmes? I, I admit I don't understand a word you're saying. Professor Philpott's does, however... Grab his arm, Watson, his bow arm. Right here. No, 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 you don't. Oh! Sorry. Orders. There you are, Holmes. Old jiu-jitsu comes in handy now and then. Now, hmm. if you'll roll up your left sleeve. Oh, no sooner, no sooner said than... By Jove, I see. That is a nasty gash. Yes. Professor Philpott's made only one mistake in his little plan to get rid of the two men he hated most in the world. The senior to whom he owed money... And the Major, who was always bully-ragging him. His mistake was that last night he forgot to put on a leather arm guard to shield his left arm from the stroke of the string after the discharge of the arrow. Any bow as powerful as the Major's has a particularly vicious backlash, don't you know. (laughs) 